Welcome to the eMedica National VTS webinars. This is the first session, so I'm really excited to launch this. I know a lot of you might have joined the lockdown learning webinars over the last three months while we're doing lockdown. Um, and, you know, we couldn't continue doing that every week because of preparation times a lot. But a lot of doctors found it helpful and gave really nice feedback and said they'd like something to carry on. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this monthly and each time we'll cover two or three topics. OK, um, so today what we're going to cover is nice cancer guidelines. We're going to do some AKT style questions. We're going to do some tips on remote consulting, telephone, video consulting, which we're all doing a lot more of, but also some specific tips for the recorded consultation assessment. And then I'm going to give you an update for all of you, whichever year of training you're in, there's big changes to the workplace based assessment and the e-portfolio from August 2020 onwards. So I just wanted to touch on that so everyone's familiar with this. That's what we're going to cover. Let's get straight into it. OK, so just for any of you that haven't met me before, uh, my name is Dr. Mohibur Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP, which means I've got a range of different clinical roles. Uh, so I'm a partner in my own practice. I work as a locum in various other practices. I work in community detox. I've got an interest in humanitarian medicine. Um, and then my main role is in medical education. So I'm the medical director of eMedica. I teach anywhere from medical students all the way to GP trainers. Um, and this picture is me teaching uh, on behalf of Royal College of General Practice, uh, Beds and Hearts and Health Education England, uh, East of England. OK. So the format, we're going to cover three topics today. In some webinars going forward, we might do two uh, so that we have time to get through everything. It's going to be very interactive. So there'll be you know, sample questions. There'll be cases that we're going to do. There'll be rapid reviews of relevant guidance and so on. So as I said, we're going to cover three topics. A few questions about NICE cancer guidelines, then some tips about consulting. We'll do a sample case and then an update on workplace based assessment. So the first section, NICE cancer guidelines. And it's an important area for all your exams. It's important for the AKT, the CSA or the RCA, but it's also knowledge that's going to really help you for everyday consulting, because if you learn who needs to be referred urgently, but also what are the red flags that need them to be referred urgently, you know what questions you need to ask when you're taking your history, what are essential examinations that if you find this or that, it might change whether they need an urgent referral or an admission or something like that, or sometimes we don't need to do anything urgent. That's also equally important to know when we can just reassure the patient. And it's important that you learn the common stuff, the typical presentations, but also certain things that are atypical presentations. We don't see them as often, but when we see them, we need to know how to deal with them, right? Like we'll all see a sore throat that's a viral sore throat in the winter several times a day, but you might only see a sore throat that's got a few extra red flags and it's a potential head and neck cancer and needs a two week wait once or twice a year. That's atypical, but you still need to know it, right? Okay, so let's go straight into the very first question. Okay, so I'm going to Put on the first question. Here we go. OK, so I can see that the most popular answer is D, unexplained breast lump with pain in a patient aged 32. Uh, about two thirds of you picked that nearly, 63%. So that was the most popular of those that filled in the poll. And a lot of you either didn't see the poll because of your browser or you're using a phone or you might have written it down at home. But, uh, you know, of those that did, um, that was the most popular answer, D. OK, so a couple of things about this particular question. All right. This is a challenging question for two reasons. Number one is the knowledge side of it. You have to really know the guideline and be able to apply it. And some of you just might not know the current NICE guideline for breast cancer. OK, the second part is exam technique, reading the question carefully. This is what we call a negatively framed question. It says, which is the least suggestive of breast cancer? OK, I, it's not saying to you which is the one that screams out breast cancer to you, it's saying which is the one that's least suggestive. It doesn't mean that it couldn't be breast cancer. Actually, all of these could be breast cancer. That's why it's a difficult question. Right. But it's saying which one is the least likely. OK. And so sometimes people miss that and that's why they pick the wrong answer. The correct answer is E. Now, only 5% of you picked E. All right. 
And, and the reason for that will come across when I go through the guideline that all four of these should definitely get a two week referral. Whereas E, you might do a two week referral, you might not. It's up to your clinical judgment according to the guideline. Okay. So in terms of the current mice cancer guidelines, one of the big changes compared to the old ones, in the old ones, there were things that needed an urgent referral, two week wait. And then there were things that were a non-urgent referral. Now there's a new category, consider a two week wait. So if I go through the meanings, a two week wait referral, so these top ones, unexplained breast lump with or without pain, doesn't matter. If they're 30 or more, then that should always get a two week wait referral, always an urgent referral. Unilateral nipple changes of concern, so things like discharge or uh, retraction or, or something like that in someone 50 plus should always get a two week wait referral. And then these two, consider two week wait referral, it means it's up to you. If you're not sure, send a two week wait out, but sometimes you might send a non-urgent referral out. It's up to your clinical judgment. If in doubt, send a two week wait out. They would rather you refer more than we miss more cancers. But do you see why that's less suggestive than the ones that should always get a two week? So if you get an axillary lump, but without a breast lump, and they're 30 or more, you might do a two week, you might not, depending on if they've got other risk factors or how worried they are and so on, it's up to your judgment. Similarly, if they've got skin changes that suggest breast cancer, like the one mentioned, that dimpling skin called peau d'orange, literally translates into uh, orange peel skin, okay? Um, you know, that dimpled appearance, okay? Then you might consider a two week wait, all right? That was the correct answer because do you see why that's less suggestive than these ones. And then even less likely, is an unexplained breast lump in someone under 30, you'd consider a non-urgent referral, okay? So if I go back to the questions, you say, look, the first two, over 50, and then unilateral nipple changes, so discharge or retraction, definitely two week wait. The next two, breast lump without pain, breast lump with pain, both over 30, definitely a two week. You can see with or without pain doesn't change it. Sometimes people see uh, that without pain as an issue. Sometimes they see this and they think it's a young lady, but still over 30. Okay. And then this one can see you'd consider a two week wait. Do you see why that's less suggested than the ones that are definitely a two week wait? So this is skin changes in someone 40 plus. Okay. So very hard question. Let's do another one. So interesting, the popular answers are B and E, okay? Um, after that, it's A. So B and E are the two most popular ones, okay? And then A is after that, all right? Um, so the correct answer here is E, refer for an urgent direct access CT scan. What do you think the diagnosis might be? Type that into the chat. Based on this, there's two diagnoses that we need to think about, okay? One's really easy, one's really hard. Can you type them into the chat form? Okay, so people are saying pancreatic cancer and other people are saying diabetes. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So definitely given the HbA1c and the symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, we've got to think about diabetes, right? But then because they've also had weight loss and they're over 60, we have to think about pancreatic cancer because it's very rare for someone suddenly at this age to be getting weight loss and then getting diabetes new onset type two at this age. And you've got to think, okay, what else could be causing that? And we're not saying that they're definitely going to have cancer. In fact, it, it, much more likely that they've just got the diabetes. But we have to consider that. Do you remember I talked about atypical presentations? Okay, it's a good example. You've got to think about an atypical presentation. You've got to think about what could be causing problems with insulin around this age suddenly. And this is one of the criteria for an urgent direct access CT scan. Now, one of the other things, if we read carefully, if there was an option of refer for a, a, a urgent ultrasound, 
then it would be correct. But D is wrong because why it says non-urgent for an ultrasound. If it was for an urgent ultrasound, that would also be another option for investigating this, okay? If we go back to the answers, the other one that was most popular was B, referred to be seen within two weeks. You see, they haven't met the requirements for them to actually need, because the difference between this is you're referring to a hospital consultant because you think it is cancer, okay? They haven't got jaundice, so I wouldn't be thinking about that. What's the difference between this? A direct access CT scan is the result will come back to you to manage. It's not a referral to the consultant because we referred everyone. It's much more likely they've just got diabetes, isn't it? And so we do this. If we see anything worrying on the CT scan or on the ultrasound, if we did that urgently, then we're going to refer to the hospital specialist. Whereas if they had jaundice, then we might refer directly for two weeks. So that's a difficult um, question. Again, exam technique, reading small things carefully. So just type into the chat, what's the threshold to diagnose diabetes using HbA1c? Because quite a few people pick, repeat the HbA1c to confirm diagnosis. Now you see, if you're symptomatic and you're above the threshold, you only need one abnormal reading to make a diagnosis. If you're asymptomatic, you need two. So they're symptomatic, they're above the threshold, but what is that threshold? Okay, just type that into the chat. At what threshold of HbA1c, if someone's symptomatic, would you be able to diagnose? So they are symptomatic. So perfect, everyone has got this right. 48, 48 millimoles, so they're above that, aren't they? So pancreatic cancer or suspected pancreatic cancer. Who to always refer two-week wait for suspected? If they're 40 plus and they've got new onset jaundice, would be thinking about pancreatic cancer. You could do a direct two-week wait referral without doing any imaging. Whereas consider urgent imaging, so within two weeks, CT or ultrasound, if they're 60 plus with weight loss and any one of these, diarrhea, back pain, new onset abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation. And one of the reasons I wanted to test this one, new onset diabetes wasn't in the old guideline. This is one of the new changes in the latest set of cancer guidelines that we should consider uh, doing a, a two week imaging, two week CT or two week ultrasound, okay? A range of answers there. And one of the things here is that this is what we call a multiple best answer. You can see, ask for which two, okay? In a multiple best answer in the AKT, you have to get them both right to get one mark. Let's say you get one right and one wrong. You won't get half a mark, unfortunately. You'll just get nothing, okay? So which two need an immediate specialist referral? That word means something very specific in NICE guidelines. Okay, we're gonna come on to that in a second, okay? So the correct answers are A and F, okay? Two-year-old girl presenting with the first febrile convulsion lasting two minutes, okay? The guidelines are first febrile fit always needs to be seen urgently, as in admission, so immediately, um, in hospital by peds, okay? And then unexplained hepatosplenomegaly in a six-year-old boy with general malaise. What diagnosis would we be thinking of? Type that into the chat. I'll just enable it for you, okay? If we find a big liver and a big spleen in a young child who's also generally feeling unwell, what are we going to be worried about? So we'll be thinking about, yeah, so we'll be thinking about leukemia, okay? Um, think about common things being common, okay? Uh, the more common type is gonna be acute lymphoblastic leukemia, all right? Um, so we'd be worried about that, wouldn't we? That's why they need to be seen immediately, are you in admission, okay? So again, it's a hard question because all of the others are also things that would need to have things done very, very urgently, all right? So you need to understand the language because keywords can make a big difference, right? So NICE guidelines, in terms of referral timelines, they use four words that mean very specific things. So if it says immediate, it means basically admission, same day, within a few hours, they need to be seen in hospital. That's what it means, okay? 
Very urgent means within 48 hours. Urgent means within two weeks. Non-urgent means anything else, basically, that's routine. So it could be several weeks to several months. And then there are specific timelines that might be used for specific guidelines, but then they won't use these words. They'll just say the amount. For example, someone that had symptoms of a TIA three days ago, they need to be seen in hospital within 24 hours. Someone that had symptoms of a TIA eight days ago, they need to be seen in hospital within one week, seven days. OK, someone with um, uh, new onset symptoms of rheumatoid, but it's affecting the small joints of the hands or feet. They need to be seen within three working days, whereas most other people with new onset suspected rheumatoid need to be seen within three weeks. Someone with early onset Parkinson's needs to be seen within six weeks. OK, so you see, these are specific things that might be attached to a specific guideline. OK. So why is it that this particular patient needed to be seen Im immediately, that one where we're thinking about uh, leukemia? Because this is what the guideline says. Refer for immediate assessment. Remember, that means admission today, within a few hours. Unexplained petechiae or what this patient had, hepatosplenomegaly. Whereas the others, they're still urgent. That's why it's worrying, right? In fact, they're very urgent. Offer a very urgent FBC, so within 48 hours, in children with pallor, uh, persistent fatigue, unexplained fever, infection, generalized lymphadenopathy, bruising, uh, bone pain. And then I've put this in bold because this is one of the new criteria. Unexplained bleeding, and that was one of the options. Again, this is new in the latest guidelines. Okay. So do you see, these two, A and F, first fit needs to be seen immediately. That's not a cancer guideline, that's a neurology. And then unexplained hepatospelomegaly immediate. That's what the question was about. All of these others, they need an FPC within 48 hours. Okay, so they're still urgent. They're still worrying. It's just that they're not immediate. Do you see, again, picking up that keyword and then working out what might be going on, that's the challenge in the question. Okay. Right. In terms of, for those of you that are sitting AKT, um, if you need any support, um, for those of you sitting the exam in August, our next course is our AKT 200 question crammer, where we do 450 question teaching marks, and then I do rapid reviews. You see how we've just gone through three questions. We'll go through 50 in one go, then a break, then 50 in one go, then lunch, then 50, then break, then 50. By the end of the day, we've done 200 questions. 160 clinical topics will be reviewed, 20 stats, 20 admin. So we're running that with RCGP beds and hearts. Booking is directly via the RCGP website, okay? Um, it's just been, the link has been posted by someone in the team. Um, it's only 195 pounds. We've negotiated, the RCGP has negotiated a discount. That course normally, co course normally costs 235 pounds. After the course, you'll get a booklet with all of the topic reviews for rapid revision, but you also can request access to the video for a month and you get access to another 200 question online mock to be able to assess your readiness. So that's running on the 2nd of August. It's aimed at people planning to sit in August. And then for those planning to sit in October um, or sometime next year, we're running our popular AKT High Yield Revision Masterclass Half Day. We ran this for the first time in June. We had doctors from every deanery in the UK joining. So we're going to run that again. It's a half day. It's four hours. That's going to be on the 22nd of August. Again, you book via the RCGP website, and that's just £75. It's usually £100 when you book directly on our website. But again, you know, we've negotiated a discount We're working with uh, RCGP Beds and Hearts. So both of those are directly on the RCGP. Uh, so you go to the RCGP website. Um, the AKT 200 crammer, so this is 2nd of August, that's this Sunday, okay? That's this one here, okay? And then the AKT masterclass, that's the half day, that's down there, okay? Um, and then we've got lots of free support. So if you're not already a member of the GP training support group, do join there. I post lots of uh, revision topics, videos, things like that there. Currently, we're going through the AKT 30-day challenge videos. The 30 days before every AKT, I post a video every day into the group. Um, for those that missed lockdown learning, they're available via our YouTube channel. There's nine hours of CPD. We did nine sessions. Each one covered some AKT questions. And then we also have uh, an AKT revision free webinar, an hour and a bit with 15 high yield questions. OK, so all of that's free. And then our paid courses, our main AKT course, we've got our masterclass webinars, three and a bit hours each time covering stats, organizational and high yield clinical. We ran those last week, but the updated recordings are available now. Uh, and then we've got our structured programs. AKT Pass Plus Bundle, 110 hours, okay, covers two courses, five webinars, uh, you know, 2,150 questions, two marks. Our AKT Pass Guarantee Program, 220 hours, 3,000 plus questions, okay, um, and our clinical case cards. Right, let's move on to the next session. We're going to talk about remote consulting tips and the RCA. And then the last session, we're going to talk about workplace-based assessment. So I want to talk to you about telephone and video consultations. We're going to do a practice case together where I'll be the patient, and then some tips specifically 
for the RCA. Okay, so really I want to split five tips. You know, we're all doing a lot more remote consultations now, whether it's telephone or whether it's video. We're still doing some face-to-face, -face, but it's a lot less than pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, right? So I think it's something that a lot of doctors find challenging. It's something maybe you haven't done as much of, and definitely it is more tricky than face-to-face -face consulting, okay? So I've narrowed down five key tips, okay? We're going to go through each of them. So these are the five. So number one, check www. Not the World Wide Web, although you might do that as part of one of the other tips. So the first thing you want to check is who are you dealing with? You might have a list on your, you know, uh, a name on your list. But, you know, when you connect to the video, if you've never seen that patient, what if it's their wife that's setting it up? What if it's an elderly patient and it's, you know, their spouse is setting it up? They're not very tech minded. Just check that they are the right patient. So check their name, check the date of birth, check the address. OK, then you want to check where. Where are they currently? Because you've checked their address as part of identity check. But what if they're not there? What if they're shielding at a relative's house and it's out of area and you are planning to do a visit and, you know, you're in Birmingham and they're in London? That's not going to work, is it? If you know that early on, you might realize that some of the options might not be there for you. OK. And then what? What is the sort of core nature of this? And sometimes you can check that through the triage notes before you even call. Why? Right? Because there are some things that might definitely need them to come in. So you might not add much by arranging a call. You might just actually ask the receptionist to organize an appointment. You know, if it's something that definitely needs an assessment, an examination. For example, if they've put down that they just wanted to book for their actually to have their smear, you can't do the smear remotely, no matter how talented you are. Okay, so you see what I mean. So you might therefore need uh, to organize that. So that's it can really help you to think about those three things. www. Number two, you have to be a bit more conscious of demonstrating empathy. You know, when someone's in the room with you. They can see your body language, that if they're upset, you can lean in, you can put your arm on their shoulder sometimes, you, you know, you're smiling. So sometimes this is about non-vocal. Let's say you're doing a video consultation. You can still show that you're paying attention by really making good eye contact, not looking at your notes and typing, by sort of nodding, okay? You see, that's non-vocal. On a telephone consultation, that they can't see. So what can be really, really important is appropriate vocal empathy. That they found they sound really, really scared, really panicky. And you might be thinking, you know, I'm here to help you. But if you don't say that, they don't know what you're thinking. So instead, sometimes you can just vocalize Look, I can hear that this is really, really making you stressed out. I can hear that you're really scared by all of this. I need to ask a few questions so we can try to work out what's going on. But we're here to help. Do you see something like that, vocalizing that empathy early on? It can just give them a bit of reassurance. OK. Number three, be safe. There's lots of things that can't be managed fully remotely, okay? And so if you've got any doubt whether you can fully manage it remotely, and especially, you know, as you get more experience, there might be more things that you feel confident managing remotely. To this day, if in doubt, I'll either ask the patient to come out or I will go out, okay? But, you know, it's important to put yourself in a position that you've made a safe assessment. So just bear that in mind. There are some things where you need to do an examination to decide if it's safe or not to keep them at home, okay? Um, don't be scared to look things up and to say, just give me a second. I just need to, uh, you know, check the dose or something. Just give me a second. I need to just check the latest guideline on this and just, you know, open another tab in your browser and look it up there and then. It's fine. OK, they're not going to think that, oh, this doctor's got no clue. You know, no one can know everything. All they're going to see is that you are actually being a safe doctor. OK, if you need to examine or assess further, arrange follow up, whether that's them coming in or whether if it's appropriate, very few patients that need you to go and see them, but sometimes that's the right thing to do. And then some patients can be diverted elsewhere directly based on, you know, some of the things that you found out. They need further assessment, but it might not be to come to you. It might be that they need to go to, straight into hospital. It's clear, you know, you're talking to someone and their chest pain worries you and you think it might be cardiac, arrange an ambulance. OK, you know, um, you talking to someone and it sounds very clearly it's a febrile convulsion. You're not going to add anything by asking them to come in. All you're adding is delay. You're actually making the situation less safe. Just arrange for them to go into hospital, you see, okay? Number four, document more. You want to document medical legally, think about being safe, okay? You know, it's a lot more risky when you're doing remote consultations because there might be things that if they were in the room, you might see that you might miss because the video quality is poor or the audio line isn't great. So just document any advice you give them about follow-up, about red flags, about when they should come and contact you. In any examinations that you'd like to do and why they're important and that you couldn't do it because it's remote, but ask them to come in so it could be examined. That's important. And you've got someone with a really bad headache and you're worried about, you know, could this be a tumor and you need to look for signs of papilledema. Again, you can't do that 
you know, you could ask them, if you bend over, does it get worse? If you, in the morning, do you vomit? But I really want to look at the back of their eyes and look at the fundus to see if there's papilledema. I want to see if there's retinal hemorrhages, okay? You know, and thinking about and documenting the red flags, which ones have you asked and excluded? And then smile, really important. You know, when you smile, it can change the perception of the patient to whether you're trying to help, or whether you're interested, where appropriate. If you're breaking bad news, don't smile while you break. I've got some terrible news. I'd like to tell you that the results show you've got bowel cancer. I'm so sorry. That's, that's not appropriate, right? But generally, you know, if you sit there and you've got a frown on your face and already they're a bit more anxious, they might never have done a video cons consultation before, as you've done quite a few by now, okay? And a, a smile can really give them the perception that you are caring and you're there to help. And interestingly, even on an audio, okay, a smile can actually change the voice and the quality of the voice. Try it and you'll see, okay? It can really help to put patients at ease. So these are some tips that you could also use in RCA for your consultations that you're recording via video or on the phone. I'll give you some specific tips for RCA in a minute, but that's gonna help you in any consultation that you're doing remotely, okay? So let's do a case, okay? This is me, I'm the patient, Abu Muhammad, okay? Um, remember, early on, you're gonna check the www. So let's imagine to save some time, you've gone through that, okay? So you've you know introduced yourself, your doctor such and such, you've checked my name, you've checked my date of birth, um, you've checked my address, and where am I? I'm at my house, which is in your catchment area. So we've done all of those things. Let's get the rest of it started, okay? Feel free to type any questions that you'd like to ask into the chat. OK, um, what would you you know, like to ask me? This is all you've got in the triage. So let's say now you've started off with how can I help you? And I said, oh, doc, I'm really stressed out and it's really affecting me in so many ways. I, I just need some help. OK, so that's my opening line. I'm really stressed out and it's affecting me in lots of ways. I need some help. Let's carry on from there. Who'd like to kick us off? Feel free to type a question into the chat. and I'll answer it as the patient. OK, so someone's asked what's going on? Oh, Doc, so many different things going on. So the first thing is, with all this COVID malarkey, um, you, you know, the, the business I work for, they shut down. So, you know, I talked to them about, can I go on furlough? But it got to a point that they had to still pay their rent. They were getting no income. Um, so they've shut down. So basically, I've lost my job. Now, I've signed on for benefits, but they're, they're going to take a few weeks to kick in. So I've got money issues. And, uh, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg, really. Someone said, um, what do you mean by stressed? That's a fantastic question, by the way, because the word stressed can mean different things to different people. Stress, what do I mean by stressed? I mean, like, I'm, I'm fed up, really. You know, I, I, I feel rough. I was already struggling, you know, uh, beforehand with, with, with money because I wasn't getting so many hours. The job was hard work, but now I find I wish I had a job. You know, um, I'm more stressed out because I've got less income. The whole thing is getting me down. So, and that, that's, that's what I mean. Someone's asked a good question. Um, what else is, is bothering you? Uh, well, what else is bothering me? As I said, there's the money issues. Um, I'm, I, I'm feeling down about everything, to be honest. You know, the fact that I've looked for jobs, there's no jobs, no one wants to hire. You know, people don't know what's gonna happen with COVID. You know, those that have got staff on furlough, they're bringing some of them back, but not even all of them. I think a lot of people are scared to bring on new people. And I had to look in, there were a couple of places that had uh, jobs going. I applied one person, they emailed me, said they had 500 applications. This is for a minimum wage job, okay, in a factory. 500 applications, they said that by the time I got mine, they, they wouldn't even look at it because they closed it at 500. They were overwhelmed trying to write back to everyone, okay? So someone said, um, what are my expectations from today's consultation? Well, I'm hoping you give me like a, you know, something to make my stress go away, doc. You know, that's what I want really. Uh, someone's asked, um, how's my mood? Well, as I said, Doc, you know, I, I mean, I'm, the whole thing's making me feel down, but look, that's not your problem, okay? Just, if I can get something to make my stress go away, don't worry about my mood, that's not really your problem. Look, I'll get to that. I think if, if I don't feel as stressed, I, I'll probably start feeling better in myself, you know? So is that something you can give me for stress, maybe? Like a, you know, a tablet or something? So someone's asked, you know, that this must be very hard. Are you getting any sleep at all? Well, that's, I think, one of the problems, Doc. Like, I have all these worries running through my mind. Like, I've got money issues. I'm worried my landlord might want to kick me out because I'm renting. Um, you know, they had that period where they couldn't evict people and I was struggling with rent. 
Um, but that's coming to an end now. So I'm worried about that. So I, I don't really sleep because all these worries running through my mind. And then I find that I can't really concentrate in the day. You know, so I'm not sleeping at night. And in the day I'm tired. I can't concentrate on anything. You know, if I'm looking for these job adverts online, I get distracted. I go on Facebook. I go on Instagram. I'm just jumping about because my concentration is not there. So I'm, I don't have any family. Oh, I do have family. That's another thing that's getting me down. So, so my mum, she's got quite severe diabetes and she's older. So she's been shielding. She's on insulin and stuff like that. So, um, and she lives quite far. So I've not been able to get there because I can't, I don't drive, but I can't really afford like train ticket. But right now as well, you know, like it's, it's not really safe. I, I, I don't want to give her anything. Okay. So, you know, it's like, that's getting me down too. Like I've got no one to talk to, you know, who's at home now? I'm, I'm, I'm on my own. I'm on my own, yeah. Just before all of this kicked off, this lockdown stuff, I actually broke up from a long-term relationship. Yeah. So look, anyway, Doc, can I have a tablet for stress or something? So, uh, you know, maybe if my stress is better, I'll feel better. Someone's asked, do I have lost interest? Well, what is there to do to lose interest in? You know, because you can't really, okay, you can go out and do exercise, but you know, apart from in the garden, I don't really want to go out too tough. I can't afford, you know, uh, things that you need to spend money on. Like gyms are starting to open again, but I can't afford that. Um, I don't feel like going out and going for a walk. So, you know, like I'm in a block of flats. There's like a shared garden at the bottom. I, I do go out there, um, but I just, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like going out. I don't feel like, you know, like a lot of the things that I enjoy doing, my interests, they need money. You know, like I used to really like going to football matches with my my, my boys, you know, um, uh, but obviously, you know, that's not happening now. But again, it costs money. Even if you wanted to like go to, uh, you know, somewhere and watch it on a big screen and, and get a few uh, meals and things like that, in, it costs money, doesn't it? What are my thoughts about the future? I'm not really thinking about the future. I, I just want something for the short term to help me feel better. Okay. Do I drink any alcohol? No, I don't drink any alcohol, Doc. Have I been coping with my stress? I've been smoking more. That costs money too, so I've been rolling my own, okay? But it, I know, I know you're gonna tell me, I know you're gonna lecture me, smoking's bad, it costs money, but it's just it's what gets me through the day. You know, it helps me handle my stress. Any thoughts to harm myself? No, Doc, no, I, I don't wanna harm myself. Someone's asked a really good question. Sometimes when people feel low, their thoughts of harming themselves, is that the case with you? So that's a nice way to ask that. Same question, but you can ask it in a sensitive way. No, Doc, I, I, look, I've got to think about my mum. Once all is over, I've got to be there for my mum. I would never do anything like that to, to harm myself in any way. I just, I'm just hoping for some help. So, Doc, Doc, I've asked four times now. Can you give me like a tablet for stress? There must be something. I can't be the first person that's felt like all stressed out and stuff. Okay, so is there something? So someone's asked about suicide. So again, no, Doc, I would never do anything like that. Okay. What have I been smoking? I roll my own tobacco. Yeah. Nothing else. I don't I don't do anything. No, none of that funny stuff, Doc. I'm not into that. Okay. Great. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll stop you there for a second. Okay. Well done. Some great questions. Um, some of you, I appreciate obviously because we're not like in the room, you might be asking one or two word answers. In the real situation you've got to think about how you phrase things right okay because sometimes if you, you ask a good example is a really important question to ask as a red flag is about suicidal thoughts right if you suddenly said to someone have you ever thought of suicide that's very blunt you'd get marked down for interpersonal skills if you asked it in that way okay so let's uh, have a look at some of the important things to ask so first thing is you know what does this word stress mean it can mean different things to different people so you've got to think what's the things that have been causing you to feel stressed and then how has it been affecting you day to day Okay, you know, the impact on their life. And then did you notice some of the body language? No one acknowledged this. Okay, someone might have, and maybe I've missed it because the chat's moving quite quickly, that sometimes you can acknowledge, look, I hope you don't mind me bringing this up, but while I've been talking to you, you know, you've been looking away and you look quite upset. Rather than just coming straight out with how's your mood, you could acknowledge that nonverbal cue. Okay, and just, you know, for example, um, when I mentioned that that's not your problem, just give me something for stress. Don't worry about how I'm feeling about my mood actively refuting that because a lot of people when they hear something like they'll just carry on and ask about stress what the patient said is yeah that's not my problem let's go back to stress whereas if you say it's absolutely my problem as your doctor my job is to look after your health and well-being if you know I, I 
definitely want to help you and find out more about your stress. But if you say you're feeling down, I want to help you about that as well. And you know, the two can be linked. Do you see how you can actively engage that patient to build rapport? Okay. So some of the things you want to ask once you see that he seems a bit down and he's mentioned low mood, you want to specifically ask about the symptoms of low mood that will help you diagnose depression. It's a good example of something that you can comfortably do remotely because you don't need to necessarily do a physical examination. So asking about persistent feelings of low mood. So, you know, how long have they felt down? Do they feel, you know, low more often than they don't? Anhedonia, people ask them, but that's great. You know, lack of pleasure in doing things that they normally enjoy. Feeling low in energy, feeling tired, fatigued. We asked about sleep, someone asked about appetite, poor concentration, feeling agitated. Sometimes people are restless, they're the other way. Uh, low confidence, feeling guilty, reduced libido, all of these can be symptoms of low mood, right? And a, a good way to start, if you think someone might have low mood, is called a PHQ, so really simple, rapid screen. So you can either ask in the last two weeks, or often I ask in the last month to give a, a, a better picture, you know, have you been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? In the last month, have you often been bothered by having little interest or pleasure in doing things? If they answer yes, to either one of these, this is the first two questions of PHQ-9, by the way, it's called PHQ-2. Um, if they answer yes to either one of them, then you might ask, is this something you feel you need help with or you want help with? And then take a full history. If they answer no to both of these, they're probably not depressed. You don't need to do a full screen. You don't need to do a full history, okay? And in terms of data gathering, you don't wanna ask about, you know, have they had periods of feeling stressed or periods of feeling uh, low before, you know? any history in the past of any mental health conditions, any history of chronic illness uh, that you want to get more details on. For example, this patient, we knew they had dyspepsia and they were on a maintenance dose of lansoprazole. 15 milligrams is a maintenance dose, okay? So you could ask, actually, a lot of people when they're stressed, it can cause more acid and they might find that symptoms of acid are worse. Have you noticed that? Do you see? So you, you, could, you could just... Rather than asking, have you got dyspepsia? That just shows you're not paying attention. You already knew that from the patient's past medical history. Link it into your question, okay? And then family history. You mentioned that your mother's got diabetes. Has anyone else in your family had any Ill illnesses, you know, any illnesses to do with their mental health, like feeling depressed or anxiety or stress or anything like that? And then I've put this as a red flag. If you did not ask about suicide risk, your data gathering would be a clear fail because it's not just unsafe, it's negligent. And so again, in terms of interpersonal, how do you ask that? If you just come out in a blunt way, have you ever thought of killing yourself? Have you ever thought of harming yourself? Have you ever thought of suicide? That's really, really cold and blunt. So you want to give a warning because it's unexpected to the patients. You could signpost. Sometimes when patients feel the way you've described, they can have thoughts that life's not worth living. Has anything like that ever crossed your mind? Or sometimes they have thoughts of hurting themselves in some way. Has anything like that crossed your mind? Do you see, you're giving them a bit of a warning and you're asking in a very sensitive way. That's much more appropriate, but you must ask that if you want to be safe, right? Good, okay. So let's move on to examination that, you know, you, this is talking. You can examine their mental state through a video or telephone consultation. You don't necessarily need to see them and do a physical examination. In terms of social, we touched on social network. You could look at that work situation. So the fact that smoking has increased, good that someone asks, do I do anything else? You know, some patients might take to recreational drugs, okay? Then alcohol intake, if they do drink, any changes. Again, when people are stressed, they might deal with that or when they're depressed, they might deal with that by drinking more or smoking. So how are we gonna manage this patient based on the history that we've taken so far? What do we think? How might we manage this patient? Type that into the chat. So do you think this patient, for example, is got clinical depression? Do you think that they're, um, you know, sub threshold? Do you think that they're not enough to quite have it um yeah probably so how might we manage them so we might offer someone said cbt someone said counseling okay so now here's a good example where for your general patient with depression you could offer cbt you could offer counseling but this patient specifically asked for a tablet and as in the guideline either giving antidepressants or giving a talking therapy if they're both considered acceptable do you see how it'd be a lot more person-centered to offer this patient, you said you specifically wanted a tablet. You could highlight, did you know that there are other options like talking treatments, like counseling, or would you like more information about that? But if not, you know, you might Google that, he's sitting at home, he's got nothing else to do. He might specifically want a tablet. Whereas someone that, when a patient has specifically said that, they insist on counseling or CBT. That's a good example of, that would be quite a doctor-centered management. 
Okay, you see that. So let's look at in terms of management. So if you had someone who had some symptoms of low mood, but not enough to meet the diagnostic criteria for depression, then you might do, uh, you know, either active surveillance, arrange follow up in a few weeks, or refer to IAPT, improving access to psychological therapy. So this is where they get self help or mindfulness, or, um, uh, you know, talking therapies that they do themselves like an app, you know, a mindfulness app or something like that, but no active treatment, not CBT, not counseling, no medication. This patient I'd say has got enough to, you know, fulfill the criteria for depression. And if it's moderate or severe, you can either give CBT or counseling or medication or combination. This patient specifically, specifically wants medication. Think about medication. So first line is an any SSRI, citalopram, sertraline, fluoxetine, any of them are fine, okay? Things that you might talk about at the end of your consultation, you might think about asking the patient to fill in and you could send them a link to do it online, for example, and email it back to you, HADS or PHQ-9 or BDI-2, the three validated tools to assess severity. By the way, you can't use any of these three to diagnose depression. You use history to diagnose depression, but these are useful. I've diagnosed depression, but if I wanna get a level of how severe is it, so that after treatment, I can run it again and see, are they improving? That's what they're for. And then arrange follow-up in about four weeks, safety netting. You said that you'd had no thoughts of harming yourself and you, you wouldn't do anything to try to take your own life. If your mood gets even worse and you do start having those thoughts, please get in touch. We're here to help you and support you. You know, sometimes people think about things like that because they feel trapped or they feel that it's their only way out. I want to know, I want you to know there's lots of support. There's lots of things we can offer you and we're here for you. You can see reinforcing that you're there for them, that empathy, okay? They're much more likely to engage and, and want to follow up, but also you're showing, um, you know, you're showing um, safety net, okay? Um, so in about four weeks, that's how long generally it's gonna take before antidepressants kick in. For this particular patient, if you started on that, at that point, what you're seeing is if they've had side effects and things like that, because you normally start on a low dose and if they haven't had side effects, then you might increase the dose if you started on a very low dose, for example, okay? So in terms of interpersonal, some really important things, picking up on the cues, you know, about their mood, Okay, some of the use of language, that's not your problem. Building rapport, actively refuting things like that, it's absolutely my problem. I'm here to help you in any way I can. You know, um, looking at their social circumstances, signposting about things like suicidal thoughts, picking up on their nonverbal cues, the fact that they seem upset. So all of this will be important in how you deal with the interpersonal side of a, a case like, and you know, not just someone that their main thing is low mood. You might have someone with a chronic disease, they're having a diabetic review over the phone and they just seem a bit down. Again, you could do a PHQ to an explore sometimes when someone's illness is not well controlled, that can get them down a bit, okay? Now, um, someone had asked, where can they find out about, you know, red flags and urgent referrals and things like that? Um, and a tool that can help you if you're about to start your first GP rotation, or you're actively preparing for the RCA, or those of you later on are gonna prepare for the CSA, or you've never done GP before and you're gonna do a GP rotation next, our CSA 100 case crammer. The case we've just done is actually one of those 100 cases. I've adapted it slightly, okay? But essentially what we do is we cover 100 cases. For each one, we go through what are the key things you need to ask with slides like this. There's a 284 page PDF booklet with over 580 slides in it, okay? Uh, but for 100, key GP presentations, we cover, you know, what are the key things to ask in history? What are the red flags you absolutely mustn't miss? Um, what are the things you must examine? Um, and because it's video, as well as the slides, you see me talking about it, I demonstrate some of the examinations, okay? Uh, what are the current guidelines for management, all right? Um, every fifth case, so 20 of the 100, include an interactive case like we've done with a simulator, with an actor, you know, playing out a role and you see people asking questions and thinking about it. So you can access the recordings over eight and a half hours. And actually it's really quite useful in that, let's say now you wanted to, um, you wanted to prepare for a case. You've looked through your list, you're doing, you plan to do a recording um, and you see that a patient's coming in who's got Parkinson's, okay? So what you could do is you can look through the list. These are all the cases. Actually, this isn't even all of them, these are some of them. We can look through the list and see, okay, um, you know, Parkinson's is on this list, all right? I can then find out look through the slides, what are the key things? And you could almost have that open or print it off and have it there as a checklist. Make sure I don't miss any of these red flags. Make sure I don't miss any of this. Must examine this, okay? Or I've got a patient coming in, uh, you know, to talk about erectile dysfunction. Okay, let me make sure these are the things in data gathering. These are the things I must, uh, okay, I've got to arrange for them to come in because there's some blood tests I need to do because I need to get, uh, um, you know, morning testosterone, I need to uh, get a test for diabetes, I need to check their blood pressure to rule out an organic cause. Do you see what I mean? You know, you've got someone where um, it says in the triage notes, sore throat. 
you know, look that up and you can see the common causes. You can look at the rare but serious causes, the red flags to ask. You know, you've got someone, anxiety and so on. Okay, so you, know, you could use that as a way to rapidly revise and you keep the booklet. You can subscribe from a month, three months, six months, 12 months, but you can keep the booklet forever. Um, and you know, use that actually as part of your revision generally to just increase your knowledge of common conditions, but also actively use it when you're doing a case, okay, as a checklist. So some tips specifically for those of you preparing to submit for the RCA. First thing is we've talked to a lot of people that came to our masterclass before the first one, and then you know they've done really well. And I've asked people to send back their feedback, and some people have said some really useful tips. So it's from that and from you know my own experience of I recorded uh, when I did I did the old version of MRCGP. We did recordings for something called the old MRCGP, but also for summative assessment. But then I also was the first cohort that sat the CSA. So, you know, from that experience and then from teaching for a long time, but also people that have done it and passed. First thing is record everything. A common thing I've seen is in people that struggled is that those that struggled, they didn't record many. They might have recorded 30, 40 cases. From them, they're picking their best 13 to submit. You haven't got that many. Whereas people that had over 100 to re that they've recorded, you can be a lot more brutal in getting rid of ones that are borderline and only submit ones that are brilliant so that you don't, just pass, you pass by clear margin. You know, we had some, some people that contacted me for help that fell by one or two marks. You know, if they'd had more to choose from, they clearly might have submitted some that were borderline because they were running out of time. It was a very short window for those that sat in, in the first sitting. They had very little time, okay? For those of you for going forward, start recording in advance, okay? Watch back as soon as possible because you remember all the details. You know, if you record everything and then you try to watch them back, you might have five different cases that were similar and you can't remember which ones are brilliant instead watch them back and any that you're not sure of get a second opinion from your trainer and you want to be brutal into triaging into three categories green are ones you're absolutely happy with you finished you know everything in a decent amount of time you covered everything you needed to you're really confident you'd be happy for anyone to see this green definite submission you don't necessarily need a second opinion on that if you're really confident amber these are the ones that you might consider if you're getting desperate Label those, you might come back and watch those a second time later or ask your uh, trainer. Red, delete. Don't even label it and say, I'll come back to it later because if you've got 100 to look for, it's going to be a waste of time later on. Just delete it. There's no point keeping it. You're not going to use it. Don't ask your trainer. You're wasting their time as well as your own. Just get rid of it, okay? Be brutal. You want to submit the best. It's one of the big advantages of the RCA. You can pick which ones you send out, right, okay? Um, get the team involved. A lot of people have said it was really helpful to get the team to prep patients. You know, if the uh, receptionists have talked to patients and explained, this is really important so that it's gonna help this doctor complete their GP training. Um, you know, patients are more likely to get on board. Um, and then patients that are coming face-to-face, -face, if you wanted to do a face-to-face -face recording using the paper consent form, they're gonna help you. But also case selection, talk to the other doctors that there might be cases that are gonna help you get the right level of challenge and get a broad range of case types because there's certain types of cases that you want to submit, okay? I'm gonna show you a checklist for that in, in a second. Read up before the case. So if, for example, you know you know what's coming and you know exactly what to ask, but in a concise way that you can refer to, you know, notes like this in your 10 minute consultation, you haven't got time to refer through a whole nice CKS five pages during that, okay? Or our, our case cards. Again, a, another concise way to have everything to hand and have those in with you and just look them up, okay? So that you know, you know, you've looked through the patient's notes before you arrange uh, to actually connect the video. You know the next one is just look at their notes and see, okay, knowing this and knowing the triage notes, it looks like it's going to be about this. It might not be, but at least you're pre-prepared. You know the erectile dysfunction guidelines. You know the Parkinson's guidelines. You know the hypertension guidelines. You know the diabetes guidelines. You know the guidelines for, you know, someone that's got existing angina, okay? Remember all three domains in every case. So every case is going to be marked in three domains, data gathering, your history, is it concise? Is it structured? Is it safe? Okay. Have you thought about the relevant examinations? Date, data gathering is one third. Clinical management. So did you get the diagnosis right? Did you manage it according to current guidelines? A lot of people managed it, but it was old guidelines and then they got a fail for management. It's the most common domain to get the lowest marks and failing. Okay. Did you have time to deal with follow up and safety netting? Okay. And then one third is interpersonal. Have you explained things in clear, understandable language? Are you picking up on cues? Have you shown empathy? Are you being person-centered in your approach, in your use of language, okay? Every single case, all three domains is one third of the marks, okay? And this is the checklist, okay? Um, in the post-course, 
reading which I will send out to you by the end of the week. I won't be able to necessarily do it tomorrow and then I'm off work Friday because Friday is Eid. Um, uh, so it might not be till, you know, like a, over the weekend, but this is the checklist. Ideally, you want no more than two patients from any one curriculum area. You want to have at least one acute illness or a couple of acute, you know, some chronic, some preventative, and then you should have one child health, one long-term condition, one urgent, one elderly, one mental health. That's ideal in your case selection, okay? For those of you that are actively preparing for RCA, our next RCA uh, intensive course um, is going to be on the 15th of August. So what happens in this course is before the course, you'll get six hours of videos. So you get a video of our RCA masterclass, which is available separately, which is four hours of videos covering things like the technical aspects of how to record, how to pick. There's six interactive cases. Um, you get our CSA pre-course learning, which covers things like how to break bad news, how to structure a consultation, how examiners mark, why people fell and how to avoid it. At the course itself, we do it through Zoom. You do 25 cases throughout the day. You'll do two full cases with individual feedback each, and then you'll be involved in another six with the group as interactive cases. We have you know, professional simulators, and then you get individual feedback on your two full cases, full mock cases. You'll then get 65 cases to practice from our online case bank with more videos to watch afterwards, okay? So the next course is on the 15th of August. If you just wanna get our RCA masterclass, the recording, this is part of the pre-course learning, it's four hours worth of uh, learning, it covers all of this. That is available on the website separately, okay? So last section, I wanna talk about the workplace-based assessment update for about five minutes, and then I'll take questions, okay? I'll finish this, I think, in by the end of the hour. The questions are gonna happen after the hour, okay? Apologies, I think there's just too much material to fit into now, probably cut it to two things next time, okay? So big things that are happening, all, doctors in training, whether you're ST1, 2, 3, ST1s are going to start straight with 14 fish from August. Those in ST2 and ST3 starting in August, you're going to be migrated to 14 fish. Some DNOBs have already been piloting it, okay? So I'm going to just show you what that looks like. And then there's some new assessment types because they're, at the same time they're migrating, they're updating the requirements for workplace-based assessment. There's some new assessment types and new requirements for everyone, okay? So you'll see in the new ePortfolio, which is run by 14 fish, Previously, you had these competencies. They're now called capabilities, and you've got these clinical experience groups. So it looks very slick, and you can see very clearly at ST1, ST2, you know, how many of the, each of these things do you need, and, and how far are you towards achieving them? So it looks a lot easier to manage, okay? So these are all of the existing workplace-based assessments. They're still there. They've not gone away, okay? But I just want to cover today the new ones. I haven't got time to cover all of those other ones, okay? Uh, those that want access to cover all of these, I'll tell you about our GPSD Max course that covers all of this and more, covers everything you need to succeed in your three years in training. So these are the four new types of assessment, the care assessment tool, CAT, okay, the leadership activity and leadership MSF, the quality improvement project that's slightly changed, and then the prescribing assessment, okay? So the care assessment tool, you only do this in your third year of training, ST3 only, and only when you're in GP, which is ST3 only anyway, uh, sorry, the whole of ST3. It's the same format as the case-based discussions, but it can also include more. So it could be a case-based discussion, but it could be after doing a prescribing assessment, doing a review about that. It could be a random case review, a random case your trainer picks. It could be a review of the referrals you're sending, you know, your two week weight referrals, your referrals to musculoskeletal clinic, your referrals to orthopedics to see if they're things that you could improve about that. So it's just a broader range of things that can be included compared to a, a case-based discussion, okay? Leadership activity, this one's completely new. There's two parts to it. So you've got to complete a leadership activity. You do this in ST3, okay? So like chairing a meeting, doing a fresh pair of eyes review, uh, maybe looking at the practice leaflet and seeing how you could improve it, maybe developing a new clinical protocol, maybe updating the website design, doing a well-being project for staff or patients. Part two is then to complete a leadership multi-source feedback. We get feedback from other members of the team, both clinical and non-clinical, about your leadership activity and how you did in that, okay? And then lastly, the quality improvement uh, project that this was always there, but they've changed slightly and broadened what kinds of things you might include in it. So you, you all need to in, uh, complete a quip. Um, usually you're gonna do this in, in either ST1 or ST2 when you're in GP. So you might do a PDSA cycle, you might do an audit, you might do a health promotion project, but you must include an evaluation of it, okay? For it to be uh, accepted, that's uh, the key, okay? And finally, the prescribing assessment, they've been piloting this for the last couple of years for ST3s, but now everyone's gonna do this. You're going to have a review of 60 prescriptions, 
and then it will be assessed for any errors, okay? Uh, and they expect you to do a reflection via learning log. So you're gonna do this yourself. Review 60 of your prescriptions, assess them yourself. Is it the right drug, dose, documentation, follow-up, blood tests that they need for it, okay? And then after you've done that, your supervisor, or if you've got a practice pharmacist, they're going to assess any scripts with errors, but also 20 samples. They might assess at random if there aren't errors, okay? Um, and then you'll have a tutorial and an assessment to look at what you can learn from this, okay? And this is the new requirements for all of you. So it's been simplified. In ST1, you're gonna do mini kex or COT four in a year, okay? That's the same in ST2. In ST3, you need six, okay? Audio COTs, you only do in ST3, you need one. So this is a consultation observation to based on a telephone consultation that's recorded, okay? Case-based discussions or CATs, so four case-based discussions in ST1 and ST2. In ST3, you'll do five CATs, the new type, okay? Multi-source feedback, you now do them in every year. Previously, it was only when you were in GP. You'll do them in every year. So one cycle in ST1, one cycle in ST2, two cycles in ST3, okay? Um, one of them being the leadership MSF. Uh, CSRs, one in every post throughout all three years. PSQs, one cycle only in ST3. This is patient satisfaction questionnaires. Learning logs have been simplified. 36 case reviews is the minimum for all deaneries. Previously, each deanery set their own about how many learning logs. You need 36 case reviews minimum every year. Uh, pa placement planning meeting, one every post every single time. So if you've got four month jobs, three every year, two, six month jobs, two every year. Quip, one in GP post in ST1 or ST2. You won't be doing a quip in ST3. Any significant event uh, analysis that is at a GMC level at any year, you need to record. Any learning event analysis, you just do one every year. Prescribing review only in ST3, leadership only in ST3, and ESR, educational supervisor review, once every year, okay? Usually before um, the ARCP, okay? Anyway, if you want full details of all of workplace-based assessment, but also a lot of practical things like the changes to the pay, contracts, expenses you can claim, medical legal issues, common reasons for people to get GMC complaints and how to avoid them, how to make good entries into notes, additional course and qualifications to do in training that will help you be more competitive for jobs afterwards or start thinking about portfolio careers afterwards. You know, um, all of the learning log types, uh, the ARCP outcomes and what they mean, uh, how to start thinking about AKT and CSA, how to start thinking about developing things that are gonna help you become a portfolio GP or specialist interest later, and the secrets to success as GP. Uh, this is all, someone's asked, what is LEA? Again, that's covered in detail in the workplace-based assessment session here, okay? So uh, just before we leave, please join the GP Training Support Facebook group if you haven't. Over 20,000 doctors, the most active group on Facebook for GP training. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more further reading. And then we're going to do this every month. So please uh, keep an eye on our website, uh, keep an eye on the Facebook group while I will put the link for uh, next month. I hope to see you soon. Do tell me what you thought. We'll send a request for feedback in a couple of hours. And I leave you with this for those that are heading off. Like anything in life, prepare and you will succeed. For every stage in training, for those starting training, for those thinking about AKT, those thinking about CSA or RC or those ending training, you know, we've got our CCT plus course talking about, you know, how to manage the next uh, 20 years of your life, all of the different career options, how to negotiate your contract, how to succeed at interview, how to compare different offers, how to succeed as a locum, how to develop, you know, any stage, prepare and you will succeed, okay? So thank you very much. Um, for anyone leaving now, all the best. I hope you found it helpful. 